Welcome. In this, the first of a several part series about Siemens' software redundancy for S7300 and S7400 PLCs, uh, I'm going to talk a little about how it works and what it does. There's not going to be many of you that will be doing a new application from scratch because the 300 series is nearly out of out of end of life, but uh, the 400 is still carrying on. But many of you are going to have to maintain or repair or expand or even contract some of these applications that already exist. And you need to understand what the design decisions were in the beginning. So before we look at, uh, at software redundancy itself, I think it's good if we first recap how a normal PLC works. So let's start from there. You have a, in your panel you've got a rack, and on the rack is a power supply, then a CPU, and a, uh, perhaps a communication processor, and then some I.O. modules and special function modules, etc. CPU itself has normally got an MPI port and a Profibus DP port. Communication processor might have also a DP port or perhaps a uh, Ethernet port and so on. You may also have expansion racks out in the field. So you've got a, a local expansion rack which has got a power supply on it. And instead of a CPU it's got an interface module and then I.O. Now these, these ones are specifically ET200M. They use very similar I.O. to the main CPU. And the only real difference is the CPU and the interface module. So you may have more than one of these out in the field in different junction boxes to do a distributed application. Another interface module and then some I.O. modules, analog, digital inputs, outputs and so on. CPU is connected, CPU is master, connected via Profibus to the interface modules. And that's more or less the typical hardware for a, for a PLC with distributed I.O. Let's go on to the the software itself, let's go and take a look at how the PLC operates. Your CPU, when it starts up, it runs through a startup protocol or a startup sequence where it does diagnostic checks and uh, sets up all the I.O. and so on. And then from there it will start with your application program. And the first part of the application program is OB100. Uh, OB100, which will be called first, and it runs only once on startup. Runs once only. After OB100 is called, it runs into the main loop. First thing that happens, all the inputs are read. So it will read all the inputs from the hardware and put that into memory in what they call an input image. And your program will use information from the input image rather than from your directly from the inputs. Then once it's read the inputs it then runs into OB1 OB1 and OB1 will then run the main program which will include function blocks, function control blocks and so on and there will be several of these and several calls to them. That's your OB1 and OB1 will on all these function blocks then operate on the program state. So in in your memory, 
you've got instance DBs, you've got global DBs, you've got all your M flags, got timers, counters, etc. All that makes up your your program state. And in here there is a output image. Which is a memory version of the physical I.O. on the hardware. When your program is running it's taking information from the inputs and it doesn't read it directly from here, it reads it from the input image, operates on all that to create your program state and then from that it then writes and modifies the output image. And at the end of the cycle, when OB1 is complete, it then goes and does a write to the outputs or the physical hardware. So it takes that output image, puts it on the hardware, once it's done that, it then returns back to here to continue and repeat the cycle over and over again. There's also interrupts. There's your um, cyclic interrupts. I think it's OB30 to 38, I think. OB40 is a hardware interrupt, and OB121, I think everybody's familiar with. You've bumped into that one several times. And that's how the program operates. But there's several places where we've got issues with this. We've got distributed CPU, we've got distributed uh, information across this Profibus cable. If the Profibus cable snaps anywhere, you lose that station, you have a bus fault on your... and you could lose potentially lose your entire bus, depending on the kind of fault that you get. This part of the plant is down, it can't be read or written anymore, so it's a fairly unsafe condition in, in some applications. And that's why we do software redundancy. And we'll go on in the next video and start explaining when do we use software redundancy and how it works. See you then.